Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Dumb SEO Questions, episode 322. Each week uh, we meet here to answer the questions asked on the uh, SEO Questions community on Google Plus and the Dumb SEO Questions Facebook group. With us tonight, we have David Rosam. David is an internet marketer based in uh, West Sussex uh, in the UK, um, the, the sunny side of the UK. Um, you can find David at um, writingforseo.org, davidrosam.com. Um, that is me? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Jim Kappa is CEO of OnlineOwnership.com. He's based in Corby, about 100 miles north of London. Um, he um, uh, is a Google product expert uh, in the uh, um, Google My Business community. You can find Tim at OnlineOwnership.com. And Richard Hearn, you can find... Uh, um, at his old website, redcardinal.ie. Um, Richard um, deals with upper echelon sites. He's based sometimes in Ireland, sometimes uh, in Thailand. Um, and, um, well, that's all this morning. Okay. <laughs> um, our first question today, uh, I'm going to talk to the guys about how, how they're titling these, but it's titled uh, Google Brutally uh, Penalised uh, um, a Scholarship Link Building Technique. Um, it's from AJ M. Werner, and AJ said, friends, I'm working with a client on his website. It's a private coaching centre, and I'm trying to rank it lo locally. His institute uh, offers a genuine scholarship each month to help needy students. My question is, since a while ago, Google brutally penalised scholarship uh, link building techniques, should I remove the scholarship page or is it okay to promote it and get some local links? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I'd be like um, asking, oh, hang on, I just want to like what's brutally penalized what was it next how did he reply to jason there who said because i'm quite interested <laughs> oh so he got that impression yeah okay so look um i personally haven't read seen or heard of anything like just penalizing scholarship links because that would be like literally insane because there are a lot of legitimate like you know harvard harvard publishes the list of scholar uh, of available scholarships um uh, would a harvard link all of a sudden like be brutally penalized because you had a harvard link it's just somehow sounds a little bit weird to me there um possibly you're not putting in very great areas i mean are you just creating like yeah i mean yeah i'm a bit can someone explain to me exactly what is the link building part of this how does this work okay so um on a, on a very if it, if it was done not very well essentially you just go out and you know you obviously on your on your site let's say you decide you're going to give um two grand to a dental scholar mm -hmm. um and then you just chuck it out to some really really uh, almost directory almost directory style scholarship sites that publish available scholarships but like low quality normally you know if you were doing it right um you would actually approach some of the larger medical schools and the actual colleges, and then they would publish links to you about what, what scholarships are available from what local businesses, et cetera, et cetera, what the amount is, do they require anything or for you to qualify for the scholarship, things like that. Um, 
So is the problem here that he's that they're getting links from these low quality sites, which as you mentioned, yeah, that's that's, yeah, that's what I mean. But he doesn't go into where he was publishing them. So, well, I don't know. Yeah, this is not something I'm. I'm I don't come. I don't know much about this, but it sounds to me like if you get just one or two links from like quality sites, that's all you need. Never mind getting lots of links from these low quality sites. But I don't know. Um, it doesn't sound like a. Uh, defensible link building technique to me. No, it is. <clears throat> I think what you're saying, Richard, is that uh, if you go and get a load of crap links, you, you won't get a lot of uh, results from it. So it's no different from any other crap link building technique. <clears throat> and I agree with you if that's what you're saying. So Michael Martinez makes the point there, quite a good point. He just says, what Google went after were the scholarship links on educational websites. Uh, yeah, okay, so just, yeah, right. <coughs> oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, so they were just literally low-quality shit site. Oh, just bad. You know, if you, look, scholarships, if you, if your client um, is, is, is really wants to do this well, you can, you can really do it well, you know. Firstly, you're not just offering 50 bucks. You know, we're talking a couple of grand here. You need to niche market it to what you are and then approach the actual colleges uh, within that area because that's who you are. You know, you ideally want to bring these people into the workforce at some point in time in, in life. Um, and, and there's some really good, you know, if you do it properly as it was originally intended, um, you know that there's some some good links to be had, but yeah, if you're just going to come up with some random number and chuck it out onto these other directory things without any qualifying attributes, who they are, who you know, you you, you need to think about it properly on on who you're going to award these to, what are the criterias. Um, uh, let me ask. Let me ask another question. Why would he want to remove his scholarship page? Is he linking? Is he also linking out to, like, is this a sort of, some sort of ring of like, why would he want to remove his scholarship page? Is he also linking out? Do you think? Do you know? Is that what he's saying? Mm, like, is this some sort of you link to my scholarship, I link to yours? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, okay. All right. So I think um, we've covered that for AJM Verma. Um, let's um, go to the next if there are no objections. We've all learned about scholarship link building at the same time. Perfect. <laughs> we have. I knew nothing about it. We've just been joined by Micah Fisher Kirshner. Micah uh, is uh, head of SEO for Turn River Capital in the USA. He resides uh, on the west coast of the USA near Silicon Valley. And we've just about covered the globe. We just need William Rock here to fill it out. Ahmed uh, Ibrahim asks the question, RSS feed for e-commerce products. Um, Ahmed says, hello, I want to create an RSS feed for e-commerce products from my website, but as you know, RSS is for posts only. Is there a solution for creating RSS for products uh, to create syndication? I think Michael Martinez has it. This you is know, a tag or category for your products. But you know what? This is the question. I actually, I actually was just on Facebook earlier, so I actually wrote a response to that. The guy asks. He says he wants to syndicate. Okay, he's not looking to syndicate content. He's looking to syndicate products, which means that he's looking. What? Well, what I take it that he's trying to do is he wants to build a product feed, so the feed can go to third parties. The third parties can consume the feed and then build their own content around his products. That's what I'm guessing it is. I'm not quite sure. It's not really sure from from the original post that that's that's the case. But what Michael Martinez has suggested will get him a feed of his product pages, 
which may also have some information about the products in the feed, but it wouldn't be an, a, a, like a product feed that you would use to syndicate your products out to a third party e-commerce system. For that, you'd probably, well, in the old days, you'd be using XML, you might be using something like JSON or something like that, some sort of feed technology. You need something basically that's gonna go into your database, grab your products, grab all their attributes, build that into a feed, Set, you know, obviously you're gonna to have to document it, give it to the third parties who you wanna to syndicate to so they can consume it, let them know what the end point is, and let them go at it. That's, but there's, I don't think you're gonna find something in WordPress that does it unless it's in one of the e-commerce platforms, you know, like WooCommerce or something, there might be a plugin that let, lets you syndicate your, your, product, your product feed, you know, as a, as a proper, a pure product feed. But otherwise, though, the suggestions there, they're just gonna get them a feed of your WordPress posts, and that's, I presume that's not what he's looking for. Yeah. Must point out too, Michael Martin is uh, a stalwart uh, on our community uh, on um, the Dumb SEA Questions Facebook group, uh, answers many questions through the week, and for that we are truly grateful. We'll move on from Ahmed's question to the next. Uh, number three on our run list, Varen Kumar Riat says, uh, Hi, Dumb SEO. I've got a new website. It's a hair transplant project. I have to rank this site for hair transplants in Chandigarh. It's not apps optimized. It's not optimized well, and there's no meta description, but it looks cool. How many backlinks will it take to get it to page two? Currently, we are at page four, um, and it's always better to have a local client than an international one. Uh, competition for this word is a high number. Um, <laughs> hang on, what have I done wrong here? Yeah, there we are, click the right button this time. Um, okay, how about it, guys? First thing is that's not competition. That's just the number of results. I presume he's talking about it. it's the number of results that come back for that query. And that's mm. not results coming back for that pure query. That's results coming back for any part of that query. So I'd imagine that's a pretty easy one. Does anyone know how big that city is? Of course, it's India. It could be huge. We wouldn't know. There could be more people so in that, that city than there is in... Is it India, I presume, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it's India. But look, there's, there's, okay. So we've got a few options and, and, and stop thinking about backlinks because just, do you know what I mean? Just like calm, calm yourself down in terms of backlinks, please. But I'm looking at this hair transplant and I, I see you don't say transplants, but I, I'm guessing they're roughly the same. Let me just actually look at plural here quickly. Um, No, it doesn't even recognize the plural. Did you mean, oh, okay, singular. <coughs> right, so we've got a couple of things. Firstly, the very first thing you see is the local pack. Uh, bonus is that not many people are actually advertising on AdWords for that. Um, so the first thing you've got is a local pack. So the, the first thing you want is for that business, they want a Google My Business page, right? Um, the second thing I notice is that the top, the, <laughs> the, you know, we've got some, some, uh, spam names already in there. You can literally wipe out quite a few of these because they're using spam in their names. So you can either use suggest edit or you can use the new, um, or you can use, you, uh, use the new reporting feature via Google, my business. So you can, you can, uh, the next thing is remove some, you know, correct some of the names in these local packs um, straight away. Um, get your Google My Business page sorted, get it onto at least linked onto, you know, from your site, get your address on there uh, on your site, get your structured data in place. So that kind of Google makes the equation between where this business is and it's Google My Business page. Um, Optimize it. Get your description in there. Pick the correct, um, pick the correct category, um, and you know, get get yourself into a rhythm with um, you know weekly posts 
on hair transplant in terms of tips, shampooing tips, maintaining the current, you know, I don't know, maintaining the current yeah, structure of your hair before your hair transplant, before and after things, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of spam in the local pack, which you can actually make a quick job of getting yourself, you know, uh, fairly up the list pretty quickly on that. The next thing I see in here is videos um, th that Google wants to display to me for that is videos. Right. Well, here's your opportunity. The next time the guy does a head transplant, you, you know, ask the patient's permission. Can you video some of these things? Build yourself a channel. Yeah. Build yourself a channel. Um, it's quite clear that people want to see videos or else why would Google show it straight under the local pack? So start asking your patients, right. Can we film your head? We won't show your face or whatever. Just start making videos. Um, then the next thing I see, the second in for me, when I've searched it, is Quora. <coughs> Get yourself involved. Get yourself involved. Start replying. Don't link drop, right? Don't think about link dropping. Think about providing actual great answers. Build up your client's branding and reputation by providing, you know, great answers uh, to whatever these questions are. And then also... And for me, in position nine is literally an article thing on hair. Yeah, okay, it is all based around hair, but literally it's an article on the top 10 transplant centers in Chandigarh. That, to me, is a wide-open freaking invitation. Um, page two, again, we've got a random YouTube video in there, which, you know, and then we've got, Jesus Christ, just dial it's just dialed. How can you just dial a hair transplant? Man, I suppose anything's possible in India. I've got to check out this site. Well, yeah, it's a directory. You think you need a hair transplant, Tim? Hey, man, I'm love luscious and bushy. Um, no, actually, that's just a directory. Yeah, so you've got directory sites. There's plenty, plenty of opportunities there. So work so on just tell it tell the so the guy knows what do you think the opportunity is when you see all the directories. <laughs> so get yourself in the freaking directory. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay. So, so the guy knows what you're saying because you you know you're saying you saw one at, at number nine. So let's let's be clear what he should do. Okay. So your first thing there is your Google My Business. Make sure your website and your Google My Business are talking together or linked together in Google's eyes, structured data, yeah, um, local business structured data. I don't believe there's anything to do with hair trance, hair uh, in local business, so just use the local business uh, markup for that. Um, Are there any I, would start, I would then look at your local pack, actually go through there and get rid of some of the spam, the spam ones who have actually got hair transplant completely in the name, um, you know, make, make, make some suggested edits there. You've got Quora as an opportunity. So build your client's brand and name by, you know, getting into Quora. You've got video opportunity. Um, so speak to your, speak to your client. They, you know, they may need to invest in a decent little bit of a, a, a camera, but you know, it's a, but they can, that's, that's an opportunity they can potentially keep building on month on month, year on year. Um, so um, Quora, and of course, you've got um, these directories which you certainly want to be in. Thank you, Tim. Okay, let's um, move on to the next number four on our run list from Michelle Korn. Uh, it's titled The Only One Commenting Is Me. She's referring to um, a review site i think um she said so i have a review site where i review companies sometimes and this one company is horrific i have tons of problems with their site so i finally started decided to start listing their issues uh, every time uh, i had them um virtual therapy well i don't know what she means by that 
Um, since I'm the only one commenting on my initial blog post, does Google see that? Um, and uh, no, it's only me commenting. Or do they think it's an active post? Richard Hearn said, uh, sorry. <laughs> And before they ask, they monopolise the market, so I have no choice uh, to use them. Uh, thanks. Apparently, that, that thing I couldn't understand was virtual stalker. Okay, so let me get this right, Michelle. You've got your own blog where, or your own site where you review companies, and then you comment on your post. Well... There's nothing really wrong with that. Um, uh, as such, you know, you're not giving yourself a link back out or anything like that. It could potentially look a little bit weird to someone who eventually lands on it and sees you commenting to yourself. Um, it, it could look a little bit weird. Uh, but no, it's like in terms of it's, in terms of Google looking at it, there's... They're not going to see anything weird. You're not going to be linking back to yourself all over the place. Um, no, uh, probably a bit weird for a user landing on there going, well, Michelle wrote the article and now Michelle's commenting a row and replying to herself. Um, but apart from that, no, I don't think, I don't think Google's going to see it as an issue. They may send help. <laughs> <laughs> But no, but look, um, I wouldn't get too hung up. I mean, I've literally removed comments from my blog. I, I can't be asked to manage them. I get spammed to hell and back, no matter how many different types of systems I put in place. I just literally, I've given up. I've removed them. No. And in fact, Google uh, removed comments from theirs. Um, a couple of months back, I think. They just they just can't be asked. Um no, so to answer your question, I don't think there's a problem. But from a user's issue, they probably think mm, a little bit weird. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, I, I, I think I would see it as being a bit weird. Um, but um, I guess the question is about how Google sees it rather than how I see it. But as a, as a user... Um, I think that uh, why is she doing this? Has she got no one coming to this site? You know, is, is this just a, a backwater? Um, I think I'd rather see no comments rather than the uh, rather than the owner of the site commenting. But that's just my view. And from a technical perspective, if you want to think about what Google sees, I mean, if you had a page which had information about company A and you come back in three weeks and you update the page and you put update something else about company A and then you put update something else about company A a few months later, technically the page is quite identical to the idea of you having a, a post and then commenting on it later on. Why Google would perceive it as anything different, anything other than an updated page, they probably do perceive a comment block and comments slightly differently from the body of the text, but I mean, the grand, in the grander scheme of things, probably very little difference. In you, Richard. All right, um, let's move on to the next. Um, this one is number five on our run list from Divij, Divij Mira. Um, what should I look for in good content writers? Um, David said, uh, hey, guys, I'm looking for some help, please. How do you find a good content, can, content writer for website blogs slash LinkedIn? Is LinkedIn still a thing? Um, especially in, 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 in an industry, insurance, insure tech, claims, tech process, automation, whatever he means there, um, where the content can be quite technical, uh, specific. Um, yeah. Um, what should I look for in good content writers? Is it reasonable to ask for a sample piece? Any other questions I should be asking or be aware of? How much should I be expecting and how, how many hours should I expect to be paying for a normal 
sized article content. Thanks. So, uh, you know, I answer this, and it's it's like, in terms of content, the industry has become quite, well, it's become quite saturated in that sense, uh, because there's a lot of agencies that have tried to jump on the bandwagon, and there's all sorts. So, literally, for an article, you know, you can for anywhere from a hundred bucks up to two and a half grand. The point that you need to look at is, you know, you've said it's quite technical, you know, for me, in a sense, if I'm reading something and it's about insurance or things like this, the, the, or, or claims, you know, that's slightly got kind of a legal aspect to it. And if I was putting that onto, you know, or if I was looking at for a client, I would want someone that is either very, uh, you know, proficient and understands that market and has regularly written about that market market so that the quality and the accuracy is there. You don't want to be publishing incorrect stuff on your site. And especially depending on what country you're in, you know, it, it could potentially you know, lead to some form of form of legal. You know, there's there's these things, but um, you can you know just Google Google it. You know, you're looking for insurance insurance copywriters. Um, yeah, or things like you know, you can find dedicated people out there, and any professional will uh, provide links or actual uh, you know previous articles that they've written. And for who? Um, it's like anything, you know, do, do, do your due, due diligence. But yeah, you know, you can literally find hundreds of article factories out there that will create something for you for a hundred bucks. But, you know, it all depends on what sort of um, expected level you want versus what you are prepared to pay. And then you need to manage that expectation based upon what's available. But, um, you know, there's no doubt you're going to have a few trial and errors, that's for certain. Um, but once you find something that you're happy with, the, the, the medium, then you, you know, you, you, you can stick with that. But it is going to take a little bit of trial and effort. There's no just one, one, one go-to kind of person, you know, apart from, from, from David in that sense. <laughs> Ah, uh, you guys. All right. So will we call that an answer for uh, Divige? Okay. We'll move forward to the next number six on our own list, halfway there. Mark Matterbag asks, that, do SEO experts also need to know HTML and CSS? Uh, Mark goes on to say, uh, just a newbie here, and I have a question. Um, which was the same as I just said. Uh, he said, and also, based on your experience, do most of your clients require you to have knowledge uh, on uh, those things? So <clears throat> you don't need to be an expert in HTML or CSS. You just kind of need to know how it, what it does, how it works. Um, you need to be able to essentially review a source code and know when something's wrong. Um, so that that's kind of the way that I would uh, explain it. Like having the knowledge to actually build sites and how to write it, that part you don't need to know, but you need to know essentially if CSS is hiding something or what something's broken in the HTML that's affecting the page. Uh, things are out of order. That might be affecting kind of how things render. Um, though that's more of kind of the skill set that uh, I would say is is required to become uh, at least an SEO expert. Yeah, I mean, if if you're going to be buying uh, these services in, you better know them yourself, or you'll get slaughtered. Um, well, Say HTML is more important than CSS. CSS is, you know, would be more important for a designer. 
but it's probably uh, you know the more the more technical you get the more important it is that you sort of understand html and to a growing extent that you understand javascript um these days probably it's javascript and javascript ain't that it's not the easiest language to learn so but I think you do need to have certainly knowledge of HTML. You need to know when you look at the source, you need to know what things do. Yeah. All right. Um, number seven on our run list is coming up. It's from Scott Clark. It's titled SSL Certificate Expired Error. He said, client ABC Inc. Uh, installed a new SSL certificate and redirected uh, dub, 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 um, non h double tp to www h double tps and um h double tp to h double tps but uh, h double tps abc.com throws an, an ssl certificate expired error in chrome and in uh, semrus how would um that um be displayed at all um if it's redirected how, how how would they be seeing that um anyway he said knowing uh, that few humans will use this address uh, what are the crawling and indexing implications for this scenario if left as is i'm not the host or the web developer so my case needs to be made from an seo point of view I'm just going to say how we can see it, Jim. In order to see the redirect, it has to do the, the, the it has to do the secure handshake, yeah. So that's why when you request httpsabc.com, it's got to do the handshake before it can give you the redirect, and that's why it's seeing that the there's an error with the SSL cert. I oh, thank you, Richard. Yeah, I see it, Jimmy. And and curiously, I think I, I mentioned on this one as well. The more I read it now, that he says that. The error that was coming back in Chrome also was that the 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 the, the cert had expired. The more I see that, the more I think I'm correct in saying that what was probably happening is they were serving an old cert on abc.com non dub dub dub. Because otherwise, if they were serving the same cert for both, it wouldn't be a cert expired. It would be a cert. There would be an error saying that it, there was a mismatch in domain name, but it wouldn't be expired. So I think it was probably just the server was set up, and for whatever reason, it was using the, a different cert for non dub dub dub. Yeah, and another possibility might be that it it's got a, an old, uh, uh, like a, an expired uh, intermediate certificate. Could be also, yeah. yeah. Chrome um, just recently started issuing a distrust for. Um, um anything uh, sold by Symantec after 2016. so um, that, that's probably another thing um well what do we tell scott clark i think there were a couple of answers there that, that he was given which which made sense i mean this is a this is a network issue like where he's got to get the devops to go in on the server and make sure that the, the servers the, the certs are set up correctly Yeah. Like it's funny with that one where the cert set up to cover the being not being set up to cover none of the dub. That would be then you would get a domain mismatch error. You wouldn't get an expired error. So I imagine it's just whatever server he's using, whether you know Apache or Nginx or whatever it might be, that basically the pointer to the cert for the non dub dub is not right. Yeah. All right, Scott, good luck with that one. Um, okay, Cassie Richardson uh, wants to know if you have any tips for influencing Google's Hotel Finder um, on search engine result pages. Oh, <laughs> I've actually just answered that. Um, First thing is be totally realistic with your location. You are not going to rank uh, for the next city next next door to you. Uh, if you're in a massive city, 
you're not going to rank for the, uh, you know, you don't expect yourself to be ranking for the, 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 the next um, community five blocks down, um, you know, unless you're super, super popular or well-known, um, like the Ritz or something like that. Um, so that's the first crucial thing is be realistic with what your location is and work on that location. Um, get your images, uh, a massive, massive, massive source of traffic, uh, is your images, <clears throat> get your images, uh, spot on. It's really worth getting in a professional photographer, um, and, you know, over a week, because obviously some rooms are occupied at the time and some aren't get a photographer in over a week and get your images really spot on. They are super, super, super uh, crucial, and Google loves showing images, uh, especially when someone uh, in the hotel finder on mobile. It's just, a, you know, the m images are, are dominant. Um, and local content works on site, works really well, you know, especially for um, uh, longer tail. So for example, if someone says just hotel, well, you know, you need to work on that. <coughs> but if someone is searches hotel wedding venue, you can certainly start influencing, uh, your positions for things like that, uh, with, with really good content on your main landing pages, as well as localized content, uh, what's in the area, you know, really go to town on your local, uh, on your local stuff. Uh, your on, on, on your content that makes sense to to your users and you can really influence the the, the local finder that way thank you Tim all right let's um, move on to the next three quarters of the way there Todd Weiss asked a question titled Google on JavaScript he said before I start coding this I, I figure I'd ask in case someone has already tested it or knows the answer. If I add some JavaScript to a site to automatically add no opener and no follow links to external pointing links, um, what does it that mean? With Googlebot Abide, I know uh, it's uh, not just the um, most flexible solution. If we were to have uh, an external link, we'd want to not no follow, which is doubtful but it is less time than going through all of the posts and updating by hand. You could do a database query and do this pretty quickly, I'm sure. If he really wants to know follow stuff, he just, yeah, go into the database and add no follow. Or on the front end, when you're parsing whatever is in the page, in the page content, the parser just look for anything that's ahref and add in realm no follow. That's pretty isn't easy. there isn't there a, a meta tag that you can set to external rel no follow yeah, so you, you can just put it up in the header you or in can, the head? but then it then it will affect your nav also but it's external it, can't you set it to be like only for external no, no, index, or no, no follow robots no follow yeah so you can put in like a, a meta tag robots no follow and then everything on the page is no follow but everything yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's yeah there's no, uh, as far as I know, it's, it's not granular enough to say, like, follow internal, no follow. Mm -hmm. right. But, like, I, I don't know why you'd want to do this, but, you know, doing it with JavaScript is a very cumbersome and it's not a good way to do it. There's no guarantee. They do parse JavaScript, but they're not going to guarantee they're going to par parse everything. And, you know, if they yeah. find JavaScript and it, alter the page, they're probably going to stop. Yeah, it's also, I think, there's potential for it being a bit seen as a little sketchy. I know that in the past, a lot of the affiliate sites would try to do stuff like that to kind of hide from the flip side of of it. So there, uh, for just links, I, I yeah, it seems like that as you were saying, kind of like you should be able to do the same kind of massive update on on via HTML instead of JS. Yeah, I, you know, you have to question why you want to do this. Like it does. You know, I mean, he may have a valid reason, but it, it, it sort of, it sounds a little bit nefarious to me, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, 
it, it's not it's very easy if someone wants to look in and look at what the rendered i mean like there's some nice plugins now that'll show you the rendered source code and show you the gifts between rendered and, and and served and it's very easy to see that you're running a javascript plugin that's like adding no follow on to stuff like you just yeah. got you just gotta, you know, open up your developer tools and just inspect, and you'll see there's a well no follow on a link. So I'm not quite sure why he, he feels he needs to well no follow his external links. If, if he's got some bad links in there, he should probably just go in and clean them up. I mean, if he's got enough that he needs to put no follow on everything, he might want to reconsider what he's doing. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's move. Well, should we move on to the next one? Recording that photo is a yes. Uh, Dean Hua asks, how long before Search Console, a Google Search Console, will show data? He said, once I activate a site within Search Console, how long before it will show data? It's been three days so far since I activated it when I switched from HTTP to HTTPS. And had to reconnect it to the Google Search Console. Thanks. Who's offering us? He's got the data already. Nobody. Ah, uh, so so he said uh, he accidentally deleted the HWP. <laughs> How would he do that? Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. He just did a profile for HTTP and he just yeah, deleted it. Okay, so Dean has looked after. Let's go to the next. Julius Gashumba asks uh, for the best WordPress SEO plugin in 2019. Why do people ask these questions? And I think you know, I saw that poll that Yoast was. Uh, Showing is number one, so they must have got some credibility back. Uh, it look, it depends what you want to do. You know, none of these plugins do SEO for you. It's the ability of what you want to do with your site if it helps you do that. None of them, and I'll repeat, none of them do SEO for you. They all in some way or another guide you through things that you can control on your site which may or may not affect seo it's how you implement and use the tool which can help your site i personally use yoast on a wordpress site i like it simple streamlined i can turn on turn off and the first thing i do is turn off all the notification little lights in yoast because they make no sense <laughs> to me personally. Um, but it's how you want to use it and how what you feel, you know, what you what, what you feel you can gain from it. Personally, call me, call me just I'm just gonna say one thing quickly, call me a cynic, but I reckon everything Tim just said is gonna be transcribed into a very nice article that's gonna be called Best WordPress SEO plugin two thousand and nineteen. <laughs> <laughs> says Mr. Kappa. Oh. <laughs> um, well, ma maybe someone would like to say what I was going to say, which is that uh, I like SEO Press. It's what I use on my own sites. And I use it on my uh, my client's sites if I uh, if it's starting, uh, starting afresh. If there's already Yoast in there, you may as well forget it and uh, just carry on. Um, no one was ever uh, sacked for using Yoast. Oh, sorry, was it buying IBM? Something like that. Anyway, um, so yeah, my my uh, my own strange view on the world is I don't like Yoast. It's full up with bloody uh, um, bloody flashing lights and buy this and buy that and update to, uh, update to Pro and my life. You can you can turn that all off, David. That's like well, as I said, that's the first thing I go. So if I've installed it, the first thing you do is go through the list, just you know, turn off, turn off, turn off, turn off, turn off. And then essentially it does what all of the others do. 
You can update your titles, you can update your description, you can canonicalize, you can set, um, you know, no index follows on particular pages, you can work with your robots TXT in there, you can manage your sitemaps. It all depends what you feel is an easier tool for you to use. If you don't like the layout of Yoast, then look at, SC, at, at what's the other one called? Ultimate SEO. Look at that one. If you like that layout, use that one. They, it's, it, they are all tools which all do the same stuff, just laid out differently. And, and it's entirely what you feel that you can get your head around. Maybe you like the structure. Maybe it, you know, it all depends what, what you feel you like or you can you can work with better well i feel i can work better with seo press which is why i use it cool that, that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying to julius oh that's another one there's <laughs> seo press i've never heard of that one but seo press it, it all depends what you feel comfortable working with that you can understand some of the yoast updates over the years for me personally i'm like well why have you changed that to like a slidey thing instead of a tick on or off. You know what I mean? It's like, well, way too many nice big freaking purple boxes there. But, you know, I suppose they've got to feel that they need to update things to stay relevant. I don't know, it's, you know, but literally all of them do the same thing. It's for you, it's the ease of use of understanding the tool, how to go through it, find what you need on what you want to do. That, that that's my takeaway like i think they literally all do the same crap yep <laughs> thank you Jim. all right let's um move on to our last question for the night um this one from i think it's the last anyway nazman naha asks uh, it's titled the best place to insert links on a page he said, when our writers, writers, guest authors on any other relevant websites, they mostly place our content links in the content body and also in the author bio. Uh, is it uh, harmful in any way or is this type of link less valuable? Let's point out uh, Michael Martinez's uh, excellent answer. Um, where would we be without Michael? I imagine the best link in the page is probably the link that's most likely to be clicked. Yeah. And just to continue on from that is the, the most likely link to be clicked is probably one that's in the in, in the initial viewport, probably in the body area where the initial gaze goes, where, where people are going to fixate. They're not going to look at the sidebar. They're not going to look at the top. They're not going to look at the nav. So probably the best link you're going to get is probably in the opening one to three paragraphs of any article. Probably the very best link you can ever get. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's um, move on from that. I think it's that time again. Yes, it is. We'll be back um, at the same time next week um, to do this all again. Um, we uh, thank you for your interest uh, in uh, our, our work, um, your interest in uh, makes what we do worthwhile. I thank uh, Micah fisher Kirshner, David Razam, Tim Kapper and Richard Hearn um, for their contributions tonight. Um, anyway, we'll turn this off.